Hey everybody, I'm uh, going to make a quick review video on government, again focusing on the New York State Regents and stuff that you ought to know as a United States citizen. Uh, but anyways, remember, first question is probably going to be geography, uh, then it's going to go into colonial period, then into the American Revolution, and then before you know it, you guys are going to get, you know, could be 6, 8, 12 questions on government. So, uh, let's get rocking and rolling here. Okay, so we win the American Revolution, and now we have to set up a government. Now remember, we are afraid of having a strong government because we just broke away from a monarchy where we really didn't have any say. Remember, uh, one of our call to arms was no taxation without representation. Uh, Washington controlled the military, and he just simply walked away. you got to give him kudos for that. So anyways, our first written form of government is called the Articles of Confederation. Um, it really gave the states more power than the federal government. Remember the weaknesses. Each state had their own form of currency. They couldn't have an army. Uh, federal courts were really non-existent. Uh, the strength of the AOC was the Land Ordinance Act. And remember what that did is it created a way to organize western territories coming into the nation. Under the Articles of Confederation, there is a rebellion. It's called Shays Rebellion. Uh, remember, Daniel Shea is a farmer in western Massachusetts, along with hundreds, um, if not thousands of others, uh, are losing their land because they can't pay the taxes. So they are closing the courts so that those courts cannot foreclose on their property. Uh, Massachusetts calls for help, and the federal government, who operates under the Articles of Confederation, says, sorry, we don't have an army. Good luck. Okay, so what this really did is it showed us that the articles were too weak in order for us to operate under. So there's going to be a change. We're going to call a constitutional convention. Okay, so let's talk about the constitutional convention. Uh, first of all, it's called, and the only one who really shows up with a plan is James Madison. Everybody else is just kind of hanging around. And then in comes Washington and Madison finally believes that something's gonna get done and he's right everybody was waiting for uh, GW to show up so they sit down and they start to ratify the articles change the articles even though nowhere in the articles did they have the permission to do this but they did now uh, there's two great compromises or I'm sorry two compromises that they ask you about one is the great compromise remember the great compromise balances the power or attempts to balance the power between big states and small states by creating a bicameral or two house legislature. The first is the House of Representatives. Okay, that each state uh, gets representation based on the population of their state, which uh, they take a census for every 10 years. In the Senate, every state gets two, so that means equal. So the Great Compromise allows the big states and the small states to start to agree to this constitution. Now, how are we going to figure out uh, population? Because in the South, there is a large contingent of African-American slaves. And so the three-fifths compromise will come out of this convention. And what they were going to do is uh, really for every five slaves, they were only going to count them as three. But these compromises are going to allow us to work towards creating a new constitution. We got to talk about the two political parties that come out of this uh, constitutional convention. Uh, they're the Hamiltonians and the Jeffersonians. The Hamiltonians are known as the Federalists, the Jeffersonians as the Anti-Federalists. Okay, uh, the Federalists want a strong central government. Um, they are going to write the Federalist Papers. Madison, Hamilton, John Jay are going to be the author of those. Of those. Uh, and they were trying to convince people to ratify the Constitution. Anti-Federalists are really against this strong central government, but they will agree to ratification if a Bill of Rights is added to it. Um, so that eventually will be added. Um, and then, remember, the First Amendment, freedom of what press, speech, religion, petition, and assembly, uh, that's one of the most important. And remember, every once in a while, they'll ask you about the John... Uh, what the heck's his name? John Peter Zenger case, 1733. He is uh, editor of a newspaper in New York, and he writes an article uh, speaking out against the governor of New York, and he gets arrested for this 
Uh, later, he's found not guilty. But that's not really important, but it is important uh, that they included freedom of the press. Or state government. The second layer of cake. Oh, shoot. I just screwed that up. God darn it, Gavin. Oh, come here. <laughs> what? Ah! Ah! Let's talk about the insides of this Constitution. Uh, first of all, a lot of the ideas come from Enlightenment thinkers. John Locke, natural rights. Baron de Montesquieu, separation of powers, checks and balances. You want to remember those guys. Remember, we are a republic. Even though we call ourselves a democracy, a republic is when we vote for representatives to speak for us, and we certainly do that. Uh, we've created a federalist government, a federalist form of government. Remember what that means? It's a certain food, layers of cake. The top layer of cake is the federal, national, or central government. The second layer is the state's. And the third level is local. Okay, within the Constitution, they've created reserved powers. Reserved powers are for the states and the states only, such as public education. Uh, next is delegated powers. Delegated powers are those specifically written for the federal government. Uh, so, for example, the power to declare war, the power to coin money. And then there are concurrent powers. Those are powers that are shared by both the federal and state governments, for example, taxes. We're going to talk about the structure of the federal government. Okay, remember, three branches. Legislative is the first article written in the Constitution. It's the people, the first article. It makes sense. The executive branch is the second article in the Constitution, and the judicial branch is the third, even though there's seven articles. Okay? Uh, legislative branch is the House of Representatives. It's the Senate. Remember, the main power is to make the law. And remember, the legislative branch has the power of the purse. That's very important. Uh, the executive branch enforces the laws. It's the president. Remember, if he's acting as chief legislature, legislator, he's proposing laws. If he's acting as chief diplomat, he's dealing with foreign nations. Okay, the judicial branch. The judicial branch has the power of judicial review to say whether a law is constitutional or not. They get that power from the Supreme Court case Marbury v. Madison. Uh, remember, John Marshall is the Supreme Court Chief Justice who presides over that case. And remember, in most cases, John Marshall will strengthen the powers of the federal government. Okay, now let's talk about checks and balances because we want to make sure that not one of these branches becomes more powerful than the other. So, for example, impeachment. Um, two presidents have been impeached, Andrew Johnson and Bill Clinton. They were impeached in the House, but not the Senate, so they were not removed from office. Uh, impeachment obviously comes from the legislative branch. Veto. Power can, or a president can veto a law. He can say no to it. However, the legislative branch, Congress, can override the veto and make it become a law anyways with a two-thirds vote. Uh, the Senate has to ratify treaties that we make with foreign nations. The Supreme Court's check and balance is, of course, judicial review uh, that we already went over. So I think that's the ones that I can think of. Uh, maybe you guys can think of a couple more. I just thought of one more. Um, you know, the president appoints Supreme Court justices and the legislative branch, well, the Senate has to approve them. Okay, so appoint and approve Supreme Court justices. We are the longest lasting republic in the history of the world, more than likely because of the flexibility that our founding fathers put into the Constitution. Uh, for example, the Elastic Clause. Remember everybody, Mr. Kerry's saying, um, it's necessary and proper to wear underwear. I know, kind of scary, uh, but he thinks about the flexibility of the waistband. His is contracting lately because of all of the running he's been doing. Uh, but remember, um, the waistband is flexible. The Constitution is flexible. It's necessary and proper is the term you have to remember with the Elastic Clause. Uh, you also want to remember the uh, amendments. Amendments uh, the definition is change and allows for change 
over time. You know, for example, uh, we gave African Americans the right to vote. We gave women the right to vote. We gave 18-year-olds the right to vote after the Vietnam War. And it would be very important, you guys, to remember those amendments. So the 15th Amendment gave African Americans the right to vote. The 19th Amendment in 1920, remember, just count, gave women the right to vote. And the 26th Amendment, 6 plus 2 is 8, plus 10 is 18. We gave 18-year-olds the right to vote. Uh, that was Nixon after the Vietnam War. Um, unwritten Constitution I want to put in this section of the video as well. Remember, it's based on custom and tradition. Washington sets the precedent of creating a cabinet. Um, of course, he also set the precedent of neutrality that we followed for a very long time. Um, political parties are part of the unwritten constitution. The committee system, lobbying, two terms of a president is an amendment. The 22nd Amendment, two terms. Uh, that would also be unwritten constitution. Uh, so would filibustering like Rand Paul did last night to stop the Patriot Act. One more item I want to mention real quickly about the Constitution is the Electoral College. Uh, remember, that is the way that we have chosen to elect our president. Uh, remember, the people vote. That's the popular vote. And then the electors uh, can decide that they want to go with the people's decision and choose who we have, or they can choose another candidate. In the history of the Electoral College, uh, they have chosen the candidate that uh, deserved those electoral votes. Um, but there were two elections in 1876, Hills and Taden, and uh, 2000 between Bush and Gore. Those were two that were decided by the Electoral College uh, because the popular vote, um, Al Gore and uh, Tilden had won. But in the Electoral College, they lost. Remember, you need 270 electoral votes to, to become the president of the United States of America. All right, everybody, hope this helped. Um, I hit on a lot of the major terms of the government. You definitely want to go through your review book and look over that section. Uh, there's also several uh, short answer DBQ questions and an essay uh, that you could practice writing. Okay, good luck.